seen before, but maybe not, not seen them through the particular lens that was suggested by the way they were, they were presented. Uh, there is, a, I, I suppose, a method to the madness in that these are all elements of something I, um, I, I want to present as a, as a potential way of, uh, of seeing the Baha'i writings in let's say, a cosmic context. Uh, and what I mean by that, the starting point for that, is a, one of my favorite passages from Baha'u'llah's kitab Akdas, towards the end, where he says, this is the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Let him seek it, attain it. And um, when I think about that phrase, 
the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. My mind, as, as a cosmologist, my mind tends to stretch back towards different sorts of time scales, like billions of years in the past. Um, and because taking that statement at face value, uh, the faith of God was there even billions of years ago. If it truly is changeless, eternal, it was there from the beginning. Then there was a, uh, a changeless faith of God before there were people. Um, and the thought experiment, which I think is useful, and no one knows the answer, but I think asking the question and sort of projecting your mind backwards uh, can be helpful in trying to get to the level of abstraction that, uh, that, is, that is needed. When we think about the faith of God, when we think about religion, we typically think about it as a, uh, a sacred book, we think about a revealer of that sacred book. We think about a community of followers um, that, have, uh, that have gathered around that sacred book as the center of their, uh, of their lives, um, as a source of guidance. Um, and that's typically... And, and then we think of these, you know, let's say, competing, non-intersecting spheres of followers as being religions. You know, people centered around these different sacred books. And so our view of, of religion is one of, uh, uh, of competing groups of people. Um, and if, however, Baha'u'llah has defined his faith as being changeless and something that was eternal in the past and eternal in the future, then we can ask the question, well, what shape did the faith of God take before there were prophets, before there were books. Um, writing was only invented, as we know, a few thousand years ago. But the changeless faith of God was still there. Uh, how could religion have expressed itself? How could the, the prophetic impulse have expressed itself uh, in, just for starters, a human society in which writing had not yet been invented? What would it look like in the moment? Uh, and what would it look like afterwards? Um, we can perhaps imagine, because we have you know, examples, echoes at least of it, uh, in, uh, in the faith traditions of indigenous people around the world. There, there were people with a certain degree of, um, of inspiration about the world, the that they left behind teachings which may not have been recorded in a book, which may not have coalesced around a, a code of laws, but which nevertheless has formed part of the narrative of those peoples uh, that last throughout, uh, throughout the centuries. So we can imagine what that might look like. And actually there's a, a tablet by Abdu'l Baha where uh, we're all familiar with, with Abdu'l Baha saying there are two kinds of prophets. There are major prophets and minor prophets. The major prophets... Uh, bring a book and establish a religion. The minor prophets are are ones such as the those in in the Old Testament that didn't found their own religion, but were inspired in some way. There's another tablet of Abdu'l Baha where um, where he says there are three kinds of prophets, and he adds a third category to that. Uh, and he said the third kind of prophet is the prophet that comes to a village. So Abdu'l Baha explicitly in includes this concept uh, of prophecy. Uh, in, in, in one of his, uh, of his unpublished writings. Um, but I think w without even knowing that, uh, we could have inferred that something like that had to have been the case because we know that, that God's, um, God's guidance has never been withheld from the world of being. It's always been present uh, in, in humanity, uh, in human society. But what if we stretch our minds back a little bit further uh, what about before there was language itself? What about when the, the ancestors of humans were uh, doing whatever they did, let's say, two million years ago? Probably on the African savanna, um, uh, probably looking a bit like, like higher primates, um, but without language, without speech, let alone without books. Um, what would... 
religion look like to, uh, at, at that stage of the, of the evolution of life on earth? We can no longer think about a prophet, perhaps. I mean, maybe uh, one, one, one of those proto-human beings, you know, far more advanced than others, maybe, maybe the one who brought fire to, you know, to primitive man was the first, was an early prophet whose name, of course, has long been lost uh, in, in the mists of time. Um, but still we can imagine, you know, uh, looking at the cave paintings, for example, from, you know, I guess this is a little more recent, you know, from a few tens of thousands of years ago. It's, it's clear that even though there was no writing systems, there was a sense of the sacred that far precedes the written word. That sense of the sacred, which is visible uh, in the in the, the beautiful cur- and majestic curves of the of the bisons and the, uh, other animals that were that were painted on these caves, the way that human remains were carefully positioned uh, for burial, uh, speaks volumes about uh, about very early human belief in some kind of an afterlife and a respect for for the dead. Uh, that, that these early humans, Neanderthals even, were, were buried with their clothing, with their personal effects, sometimes flower petals scattered around, around, the, around the grave, things like this that archaeologists can discover traces of. So the, the religious impulse, the impulse of, of spirituality, is something which is very ancient in, in, indeed uh, and has been with the human race as long as we, we've been humans. But also far back before we were human. So what if we project our, our minds even farther back to um, a time when there was uh, the only life on the planet were the unicellular creatures uh, that were floating in the oceans you know, a couple of billion years ago. The changeless faith of God was still there. What form could it have taken? Uh, now there's no question of there being a positive. There's nothing even like a prophet that we can imagine, but there's still something like divine revelation. What form does divine revelation take if it isn't channeled through the, the mouthpiece of a prophet? Uh, evolution. evolution itself. The process of the emergence of life itself, of the complex from the less complex of higher forms of consciousness from lower forms of consciousness is, a, is something which is continuous with the emergence not only of life on earth but of existence itself. And this, you know, this thought experiment sort of projects our minds back into, um, into a world where there is still the reality of revelation but that reality no longer necessarily takes the form of uh, of words and letters on a page. Baha'u'llah, I think, gives us a more specific answer in one of his tablets that was actually translated by Shoghi Effendi uh, in the 19, <coughs> early 1920s. Uh, this is kind of a lost gem. It was translated by The Guardian and published in an obscure academic uh, Baha'i journal called The Dawn, which was published in Burma in three languages, in uh, English, Burmese, and Arabic. And it only ran for a few uh, for a, a, a few issues in the in the early 1920s, and Shoghi Effendi contributed to this uh, to this journal. And there's some selections of translations from the writings of Baha'u'llah that are that are in this journal. And one of these, um, in one of these, Baha'u'llah says that um, all. And this is a paraphrase, but he says all of the laws and ordinances of religion are subject to change and transformation, except for the law of love, which, like a fountain, is ever replenished and whose flow never ceases. So he identifies love as that changeless factor uh, that's behind everything. But where was the love in the primordial ocean uh, one or two billion years ago when there was nothing but but one cell animals. Well, what form does love take? Abdu'l-Bahá tells us elsewhere that love, it's not something that just, that, that can only be defined between one human being and another, but love is a universal phenomenon of attraction that is found throughout all the kingdoms of existence. 
beginning with the mineral kingdom. Abdu'l-Baha talks about love in the mineral kingdom as the attraction of elements that allow minerals to cohere. Um, the law of gravity. He doesn't say it, but I'm sure he would he would agree if someone were to say the law of gravity itself is perhaps the the most universal uh, and and beautiful expression of this law of love in, in creation. There is no repulsion in gravity. Everything is universally attractive. Um, and it's interesting actually that and there's a deep wisdom in this too. I think or deep insights that can be drawn from this when you look at the very early universe and how. The, the gravities, uh, the gravity uh, acted to coalesce the, uh, the 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 galaxies from the from the primordial remnants of, of the Big Bang, this like completely diffused mixture of hydrogen and, and, and helium uh, that um, that was a result of, of the Big Bang uh, was evenly spread throughout space, except for tiny little fluctuations that, as far as cosmologists have been able um, to infer, uh, uh, have their origin uh, at the quantum level, uh, that uh, just the, it has something to do with uh, some randomness that's baked into the, uh, to the state of things. And, and that randomness led to initial slight fluctuations in the density of this, of this primordial hydrogen and helium that seeded the evolution and, and creation of, of galaxies and stars, uh, and which led to the, the clumpy distribution that we see now when we look out in the sky. The stars seem more or less evenly spread throughout the sky, but when you look farther out and you look at the galaxies uh, much farther out, each of which comprising you know, perhaps hundreds of millions of stars, the galaxies are not spread throughout the sky evenly. They're spread throughout the sky in a very clumpy fashion. You have clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies. And then you have voids where the, where the clusters, uh, in between the clusters. The voids are not there because of repulsion. The voids are there because attraction created the clusters. So what might that, this is a little bit of a side, this is a side point, but what might that say about forces of love and hatred in the world? I mean, there's, there's love in the world. There's a universal force of love in the world. And perhaps some of what we interpret as hatred is just the voids between the clusters. I mean, there's self-love. There's love of people for those who are like themselves. One of the most universal results in the field of sociology is, is that people tend to hang out with other people who are like themselves. The same race, same religion, same nationality, for obvious reasons, same language, same socioeconomic status. It's almost a predictor of who your social network will be, what, how you identify on these, uh, in these various attributes. And so social clusters are created. You can think of them as like little social galaxies that sort of are created that are, self, that are held together by the self-gravitation of, uh, of mutual love. Um, and the fact that one cluster is separate from another cluster and there isn't much in between them um, isn't necessarily because there's hatred between one cluster and the next. It's just because the self-love has drawn them apart. So, so leaving that, that side point, um, I said yes. Uh, I had a little comment on that. I was thinking that even if you look at organizations which are kind of theoretically structured around hatred, I mean things like you look at some like modern neo-Nazi groups or, or like um, so alt-right communities that are <coughs> largely built in antipathy to things. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you look at what the people who are parts of them say, why they stay there, it is still it's community. It's they feel supported. They feel like they found like-minded people. It's still, I mean, even in such a twisted manifestation, right. the thing that holds it together is not the hatred. They don't want to belong. Yeah. Right. The way they self-define themselves, it's not in terms of we hate X, but rather we love our own kind. And as, as again, as, as twisted as that may be, that's, that's so an expression. So one more analogy based on what you're saying. I mean, if I remember correctly, this from Abdu'l-Bahá, so when you're saying, for example, light and dark, you know, like darkness is actually void of lightness. Right. So if you're right. saying, you know, these clusters where lack of... Yeah. Hatred is the absence of love. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps. I mean, perhaps there also is active hatred. I don't want to deny that that's also a reality. The difference is the absence of love. Yeah. Indifference. Indifference is the absence of love, perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps there's more indifference in the world than there is hatred. 
Yes. So if you're saying that love is a motivation that people are like-minded and gathered together because of race, religion, language, nationality, and so on, what does that say about those people who venture away from that mm -hmm. and actively, consciously seek out something different or maybe not seek it out, but feel comfortable in transcending those? They cross out of their compact little units of love to seek a greater love. I think we call those people Baha'is. <laughs> <laughs> that's always been around. They're always going to be yes. people that step out of their company. Right. Perhaps that is <coughs> looking at this in the, in the, in the cosmic context. Um, again, and going back to the early moments of the Big Bang, and what were the manifestations of love at, at that level? It was the, it's the, the gravitational attraction of elements and the, and the electrical attraction of elements that create the higher, you know, higher uh, atoms of different, uh, of different nuclear masses and, and, and so forth. But as love evolves throughout the universe, um, and now we're talking what, what scientists would simply call evolution, but what we can call the, the evolution of love or the emergence of love and consciousness, it's the same thing. We're just sticking a different label on you know, a different sticky note you know, on the same reality. And we can easily get confused that it's two different realities because the words on those sticky notes are two different words. But the, the thing that, that's being described is the same, it, it, the same thing. And physical evolution, I would suggest, is a, um, is a deeply spiritual manifestation of the evolution of consciousness in creation. And that evolution of consciousness is, is not um, random, but there's a direction to it. And the direction, in scientific terms, I suppose, is from the least complex to the most complex. Why is that? Because higher degree of complexity uh, can act as a substrate for, um, for sustaining higher degrees of consciousness. And ultimately, it's the consciousness which is the arrowhead of the evolutionary process. This point about consciousness is not part of the scientific uh, narrative today. The, the, the scientific narrative of evolution is that there is no intrinsic directionality to it and that it's all accidental. Uh, but that's an opinion. Uh, I, there's no scientific proof for that. Just as I'm not saying there's scientific, scientific proof either for the statement that there is an arrowhead, that there is... Uh, and that arrow that has something to do with consciousness. That's a, that's a claim uh, about the universe that we weigh the evidence against and decide, is this, you know, does this make better sense of the world? Does it make better sense of human life? Does it make better sense of human culture? Because this idea, this principle of love evolving and becoming more and more uh, conscious is, uh, is something which you can almost see in the fossil record. I mean, it's, it's something that has definite physical antecedents. There's a, there seems to be a, a progression of life from, uh, from the simple to, to the complex. But even that, I mean, one has to admit, it's not, you can't plot it like a line. I mean, it's organic. And being organic, it's messy. You can have, um, you can have, periods of apparent regression. You can have periods where, I mean, look at, look at life on Earth and the evolution of life on Earth about 65 million years ago. Accidentally or not, an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. At the time, the dinosaurs were the most advanced, you know, most complex form of life uh, on the planet, certainly the largest. Um, and uh, and it, it's almost as though evolution had to take a step backwards in order for uh, the mammals uh, to, uh, to, to take over and, and then become the dominant life, life form on the planet. But it's an example of, you know, you, evolution is like a tree. And, and this tree is, let's say, destined to bring forth a certain fruit. And that fruit is consciousness. Particularly, as Baha'is would say, uh, the ability to know and worship God. Uh, but that consciousness is not necessarily destined to appear at the tip of this or that branch. The, 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 the point of the tree is to produce fruit. Now it may be that in a certain season, a storm arises and it shears off a whole branch of that tree. Uh, that doesn't 
that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that the purpose of the tree has not been served. It just means that the fruit is not going to appear for the tip of that branch because it's just been shorn off the tree. Uh, so, yeah, comment on that. Yes, yes. And so you're anticipating, um, two, I think, two sessions from now. We'll return to this point about free will. Because this, because, well, I'll, I'll just mention it now because it, it, it won't hurt to, to repeat it. But the, the overarching symbol that Abdu'l-Baha gives us that I think makes sense of all of this, you know, the world around us, the, the writings, the idea of evolution, science, religion, consciousness, God, everything, uh, is encapsulated in, uh, it was Unit 7, uh, where Abdu'l-Baha talks about the circle, the circle of existence, comprised of arcs of descent and nascent. And, and this evolution of life, this evolution of love, this emergence of consciousness, is the motion around the arc, around the circle this motion comprising arcs of descent and ascent. And the descending arc is what we would call physical evolution. And the ascending arc is what we would call spiritual evolution. And we as human beings uh, sit at the bottom of that arc. Now, we've defined it as the bottom of the arc because we're human beings, and so we're naturally anthropocentric. So we're going to define our cosmology in a way that gives us a special position. And the special position we give ourselves is we're, we're at, the, uh, at the inflection point in that arc, at, at the end of the arc of descent, where it first turns and, and starts to come back to the top of the circle. And the top of the circle is, the, is where creation emanates from. The top of the circle is the primal will. Um, it's, the, it's, the emanative, it's, it's the emanating light of the sun. Um, but this sun, the rays of this sun, don't just go out into empty space. They go out and at some point they curve backwards and they return to the sun. In reunion with the sun, the reunion of the, and the completion of that circle, the perfection of the circle, is the ultimate goal and purpose of consciousness. Uh, we're going to come back, come back to that. But going back to, to, David, to David's point, I wanted to get to it because I'm sort of working my way to it. The love begins to manifest itself at the elementary level and it and it and it manifests itself in the coming together of elements which enables higher degrees of consciousness and those higher degrees of consciousness can also be almost be thought of as concentric circles uh, particularly in uh, and I'm sure we've all, all heard this metaphor before that that sort of the lowest form of love in the human realm is love for oneself it's still a form of love, but it's the lowest form of love. And the next highest form of love is love for one's family. And then love for one's extended family and neighborhood. And then love for one's community and love for one's, you know, and on and on outward in whatever gradations you, you want to assign. One's race or one's nation or one's whatever. And the highest concentric circle on this planet uh, is when our, our love extends to encompass everyone. So, so when, when we talk about and think about people whose sense of love and whose social awareness bridges these social galaxies, you know, held together by this gravitational force of self-love. When we think about those whose love manages to jump across the boundary to someone of another race or someone from another uh, nation or someone from a completely different background, um, we can think of that as an expression of, uh, of love at a higher degree of evolution. You know, at a higher and a higher degree of expression than than love for self or love for those who are who are simply like ourselves, and therefore you know more fully expressive of the ultimate goal of creation, which is that this love becomes all embracing until it becomes um, until it extends outward infinitely, and when it does that, that circle of creation is completed. But to come back to the um, to, to come back to, to the metaphor of the of the changeless uh, faith of God, um, and 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 looking at history, so Baha'u'llah says that there's 
there's something which is, which is unchanged throughout all of this. But we're talking about change. I mean, all of this time we're talking about evolution and change. Uh, and so it's a bit of a paradox that you know, there's something that's changeless and there's something that, that's changing. Um, and in particularly, in particular, when we look at, at human history, and now I'll, I'll narrow our focus just to the last few thousand years of human history. Um, and when we try to analyze what, what's been happening with humanity and its progress towards this higher degree of love, and its progress towards this higher degree of consciousness, um, as far as we can reconstruct it, you know, because history is a very fragmentary science. You know, we only have what's left behind by people who happen to write things down. And the things they happen to write down didn't necessarily correspond to the important things that really happened. You know, they might, just, they might have just written about the kings and the, and, the, and the wars. That's usually what we read about in history, which isn't really necessarily what really was going on. Um, but as far as we can reconstruct what was going on in human history, let's say between uh, in, in, in the millennium before Christ, there was not just an evo a continuing evolution in human consciousness in those few centuries before Christ. I'm thinking about the period around 200 to 800 BC, you know, several century period. It wasn't just continuous evolution like business as usual. There was a step function. There was a major transformation in human consciousness that happened back then. Uh, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, an influential thinker named Carl Jaspers has, has given a name to this. He's called it the first axial age. Uh, and the reason why he chose the term axials is very, uh, it itself is very, uh, it kind of tells the whole story. Um, what he identified was that there was a major transformation in human culture and human consciousness that happened a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, in which, uh, and this happened across multiple cultures almost simultaneously. So this happened in China with, uh, with Lao Tzu and Confucius. It happened in India with, um, with, uh, and with, with Buddha as well. It happened in, uh, in the, in the uh, in Persia with Zoroastrianism. It happened in the Near East, uh, in Israel with uh, some of the, of the Hebrew prophets. It happened in Greece with the emergence of uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Um, so across you know, most, you know, most of, the, of, of the world that, that, that um, archaeologists can, and, and historians can identify, there was this common transformation from west to east in which humanity sort of changed the way it looked at the world fundamentally. Prior to this, let's say people were more or less animist in their way of thinking. People thought of spirits, let's say, as inhabiting the wood and the stone and idols and animals and so forth, in, in a sense that there was no fundamental separation between our human existence and a spiritual world. It was all of a piece. It was all one uh, connected thing. Again, one, one can see echoes, the, uh, echoes of this in some indigenous, uh, indigenous traditions. Um, what happened during this axial age was the idea emerged that maybe we're in this world, but we're not of this world. Maybe there is a, a, a physical world, and beyond that, or above that, or within that, or in some other way disconnected from it, a spiritual world. The idea of existence being like a, a, a building with two stories emerges during this axial period. Um, the idea that we are born in a physical shell, in a physical being, but, and we're on some sort of a journey, uh, and the end of that journey is leaving this physical plane and entering into a spiritual plane. This is part of the axial, and, and the reason why it's called the axial age is because you know, it's an axis, and the axis goes up. You know, there's an axis mundi is, is one of the phrases that you hear, in the world axis. Like, here we are on the bottom, but if we, if we grab hold, we can sort of ascend and go up to that, to that next level. So the reason I bring this up, and, and the reason I, I think this is important, is that it's an example of how... Um, uh, human 
society and culture uh, and civilization can both be continuous in its evolution and, and continuous with the, with the distant past, you know, with the cosmic past, uh, but also exhibit a certain degree of discontinuity. You know, there, there can be periods, and not instantaneous periods, but these periods can span a few centuries. There can be periods when there is a, a, a leap from one degree of understanding to another degree of understanding. We might call this, at first axial age, the um, humanity's collective transition from infancy to childhood. That might be one way of thinking about this. Uh, and you can probably guess where I'm going with this. A lot of you might go, where am I going with this? <laughs> right. So could there have been, or could we be in the middle of the second axial age? <laughs> Clearly we're transitioning to something. Um, but the reason I brought up the first axial age is because that first axial age, as momentous as it, as it, as it was, it took several centuries for it to take place. Perhaps we're now on the threshold, or maybe we're in the middle of, or maybe we're in the later stages of a second axial age, a second transition. Um, we're all familiar with the idea of saying we are passing through adolescence on our way to maturity. So, and that's basically the idea that I've taken the first half hour to, basically say, to say this, you know. It's, that it's certainly messy. It's certainly messy. It's violent. It's, it seems to move in the wrong direction it's in moody. ways. It's moody. It's, it's moody. <laughs> it's all of these things. Absolutely, it's moody. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and having passed through that stage, or uh, once you pass through that stage, you can't go back. Right? You can't turn back the clock. And here we are, humanity, passing through its, a second axial age. We're passing through our collective adolescence. It's a period. And, and when did this period start? Um, probably it started around the time of the scientific revolution. Um, and, so, uh, and that's why we're talking about science as well as religion in, in the next uh, few sessions. Because science is, is uh, and, and the, the discovery, let's say, of the scientific method is central to the ideas we'll, we'll be discussing in the next couple of days. The, uh, the starting point of this second axial revolution, this great leap forward in human consciousness, um, can tra it has traditionally been uh, pinpointed to uh, Copernicus's publication uh, of that famous book whose title I cannot at the moment remember, um, in which he proved that, uh, or, po or postulated with some evidence, that the Earth actually goes around the sun. And not that the, not as everyone else thought, that the sun goes around the Earth. Um, and Copernicus and his, and uh, Abdu'l-Bahá writes about Copernicus, Copernicus actually in his Tablet of the Universe, um, which uh, is being translated, hopefully will be published uh, soon. Uh, he had, there's a, a, a long tablet where he talks about astronomy and the, and the discoveries of, the, of, of, of great astronomers. Um, so the discovery of Copernicus was one of the opening shots, one of the opening uh, shots across the bow to the old way of thinking about things that, that dated back to this first axial age. Uh, an old way of thinking in which, in which human uh, existence could be very crisply defined as, this, you know, as, as separated into this physical world, uh, the, the material world, and the spiritual world. And the idea and coherence of there being some separate spiritual world uh, apart from the physical world began to be uh, challenged by the results of science, beginning with Copernicus and, uh, and his discoveries. Uh, and by the operations of the scientific method, which were outlined by Francis Bacon around, uh, around that same time or a little earlier. The idea of science being a, a collective process of gathering evidence quantitatively, of making um, deductions or making hypotheses from that, uh, from that evidence, and then making further measurements and testing your hypothesis against, against the evidence and continuing to iterate. What we all now take for granted as being, let's say, common sense, 
uh, wasn't really operationalized until, until that first scientific revolution. What I'll be suggesting is that that first scientific revolution, we think of it and it's written about and people talk about it as a material thing. As, you know, it's totally, it's a matter of the human intellect, it's a matter, it's, a, it's, it's part of the story of the material progress of the human race. Um, but I will um, suggest that the scientific revolution was a spiritual revolution. Uh, because ultimately spirit and matter are not, you know, are not as separate as we think they are. And ultimately what we think of as our mental powers, our logical powers, our reasoning powers, our spiritual powers. Afterball says this very clearly in, in some answer questions. So this artificial divide between their scientific progress and then there's religious progress. Um, let's allow ourselves to imagine that that's mostly us imposing some sort of cut point you know, a division in things that may not be the most helpful way of, of understanding. Uh, and the reason why I think it's not the most helpful way of understanding is because if we think of the last several century period as uh, defining the second axial age, the emergence of humanity th uh, from its childhood into its adolescence on its way to maturity, the second axial age being our, our collective adolescence, then its starting point was the invention of the scientific method and the development of modern science, and the culmination of it is what we are presently uh, in this room celebrating as a community, which is the dawning of a new spiritual age for mankind. Uh, these, are, these are part of the same process. It's part of the same uh, process of emerging from our collective childhood. And having emerged from our collective childhood, there is no going back. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. You can't unring the bell. The way we think about religion in the future cannot refer back to, or cannot simply be uh, a repetition of how we thought about religion in our collective childhood. It requires us, and, and, and when we think about the, the, the present day conflict between science and religion, and we think, well, the, the answer is to just affirm religion. Um, maybe the answer, in, in the sense of going back to how we thought of it before and saying, well, we've somehow departed from the original truth, and now we have to go back and affirm that spiritual truth from before. Maybe it's actually the other way around. Maybe the spiritual truth we have to affirm lies on the other side of the scientific revolution. It lies on the other side of modernity and not... Uh, and, it, and, and not a retreat uh, to earlier ways of thinking, which forces us to enable, to allow ourselves to think about spiritual topics in fundamentally different ways. So, um, how are we doing on time? We have like 10 minutes left? Oh, yeah. 10 or 15 minutes left. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments at, the, at this point? Yes. You said earlier about the organic nature of things in that new message. And I'm yeah. thinking of that, is it not possible that that messiness is just a lack of depth perception on our part? That there is no messiness, that it all has purpose. It just certainly you can't see it. And yeah. I'm reminded of the Steve Jobs speech mm -hmm. you can't connect the dots going forward, mm -hmm. but you can in your own life, you can't yeah. connect them going backward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, messiness is a, is a point of view. Just ask any child when you're asking them to clean their room. Uh, yes. Yes.
something that early in time without some kind of inspiration. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. I'm just a little intrigued with what you're saying this morning. I'm also thinking of the readings we had a lot of the days and we collected it all up for us. And yes. It up, um, but this um, reference to consciousness, and only in Oreo you refer to spirit or spirituality. Yeah. And I'm getting to uh, something we were reading yesterday. The distinction, if any, between our soul, our personal, individual spiritual life, and our soul and our relationship with our maker and the collective soul, because I hear you talking a lot about the collective, and of course I think there's very little difference, but mm -hmm. look at the thoughts. Yes. Take us down, perhaps, or, or upwards. Yes, and those we'll, we'll hit on that specifically day after tomorrow. That's when we'll really get into the question. Consciousness, individual consciousness versus collective consciousness, and particularly the quotations from Unit 4, uh, which seem to kind of chip away a bit at our, the foundation of our understanding about self and other and subject and object and so forth. Uh, but we'll have to sort of work our way to that, to that point. Um, what I wanted to, to, uh, to say a little bit more about first is the, go back again to the, to the scientific revolution uh, and ask, and, and sort of say, talk a little bit more about what it, what it represented. Um, it wasn't just a um, it wasn't just a new way of, of exploring reality, a new way of, of, of getting results. Uh, but also what came with it was a profound reorientation uh, in human thought, prior to which our reference to truth was always back in time, before the scientific revolution. Uh, and this is part of the childhood of the human race. And just like a child, a child refers to and is governed by the authority of the parent. So in, a, in exactly the same way, uh, human civilization prior to the scientific revolu uh, revolution, on any dimension you can name, you know, the, the pre-scientific dimension, the political dimension, the religious dimension, the medical dimension, you know, any reference to, whenever you wanted to know how things work, you would refer to some previous authority. How was the earth created? Go to the Bible and read Genesis. You know, how do, uh, what's the cause of sickness? Go to Galen, you know, and read this ancient Greek philosopher, or, or read Aristotle, who will tell you, you know, the causes of human sickness. Uh, how do, you know, what, what about the, the, yeah, the, like the four humors and so forth. What about the, the motion of the stars in the sky? Well, go to Ptolemy, who tells you about how the, uh, how, how the sun and, and all the other planets orbit around the Earth. Uh, who should I follow? You know, who, who's, who's in charge? It's the king. And why is it the king? Well, because he was given that authority by God, and he got it from the king before him, got it from the king before him. You see, you know, in the political domain, and as well as uh, all across human life, there was an appeal to authority was the way that people navigated the world and the way people referred to the truth. And that authority was always something that was in the past. What happened with the scientific revolution was appeals to authority were systematically rejected. Beginning with astronomy, beginning with Ptolemy and Copernicus saying actually maybe it's the other way around, uh, and with Galileo who was you know, nearly uh, a martyr to that, to that discovery, uh, and Giordano Bruno, who was a martyr to that discovery, who said, well, maybe the stars are really just like the sun, who's burned at the stake for that and other strange, uh, strange musings. Uh, and so it started the, this, uh, this chain reaction of shift in human consciousness from looking to the past to looking to the, to, to, to looking to the present and the future, for the truth, and by inference, the, you know, the, the, the future, began with, uh, began in, in the astronomical realm. And then it quickly, uh, this fire quickly burned up all of the existing human institutions. You had uh, monarchy was, was you know, soon to fall after that. Uh, it, it still exists in a kind of vestigial form today, but it was, you know, it was a result of the scientific revolution and what we, what we today call the Enlightenment, 
that people started to reject the idea that, well, maybe uh, this aristocracy and this king you know, don't have any right to govern us just because they say, you know, God gave us the right. That's an appeal to authority. Well, what are they doing for us, you know? Is government, cre- you know, is government helping the people or is it contrary to the, to the good of the people? We started asking different sorts of questions and we started giving, getting different sorts of answers and there were revolutions as a result of this. An idea that, uh, that actually maybe human society is not just the static thing that, that had some origin in some distant past and which we just need to preserve and rather starting to think about human society as something which is evolving, something which is progressing, something which tomorrow hopefully will be better than today because we have different instruments in place and different processes in place to govern ourselves better. So, so this was a product of, of, the, uh, of enlightenment thinking, the scientific revolution and the rejection of religious and also scientific authority. I mean, people appeal to Aristotle for, you know, if you wanted to ask, well, how many teeth do, pe- do human beings have? Aristotle said, well, women have fewer teeth than men. And people took that as given for 2,000 years without bothering to count. <laughs> so things like that, which now just seem ridiculous because, you know, because we now understand that, if, that, that to get to the truth, you observe the world. To get to the truth, you don't refer to some past source of truth because truth is evolving. So, um, you might guess where I'm going with this too. The, the, in succession, over the centuries, beginning with the, the scientific revolution and going up to around, let's say, the mid 19th century, uh, the last domino to fall, the last uh, great human institution that had yet to come under the, the light of the Enlightenment, the light of reason, and, and to accept the notion of progress was the institution of religion, uh, which continued up until recently and still today, the dominant mode of religious thought is one in which fundamentally it's based on appeal to authority rather than appeal to reason. So the, and the enlightenment thinking, that, that fundamental shift in human consciousness from looking backwards for the highest degree of truth to looking forwards to the highest degree of truth has yet to fully enter the consciousness of the human race as regards religion itself. And this is where, as we all know, as Baha'is, the principle of progressive revelation is fundamentally, uh, I'm not going to say it's a product of the environment, uh, of, of the enlightenment, but it is absolutely, it goes hand in hand with that fundamental insight of the enlightenment that ultimately the future will bring us closer to the truth as humanity continues to advance, as the circles of consciousness begin to expand outward and as that power of love is manifested to a higher and higher degree. So um, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a good stopping point. It's a good stopping point for, for the moment to take a few more questions and then, um, and then we'll actually start putting together pieces next time. Yes. I'm intrigued by the comment you had that there is a third level of uh, prophecy mm-hmm. or spiritual guidance being on the, do you say the village level? Yes. So I wonder, especially because we see Native American, African, Pacific Islanders, Siberian, Native people have these. I wonder if, like in Europe, many of this knowledge was coming through women who were known for being healers and midwives, even in French, a midwife is called a sage femme, a wise woman, who were then targeted by the church as witches. And so a whole thousand years of wisdom and insight and learning from humanity was (laughs) destroyed, was avoided. Quite possible. Okay. Yeah. No right answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows? You have to be there, huh? Yeah. Well, you think about Buffalo Catwoman, though, but she did mm-hmm. come with. Mm-hmm. There, I, my understanding is there was some revelation involved with that. It wasn't just maybe on the village level that she came with some. Yeah. But. Um, there were, yes. So if, if you're interested, actually, this. Think, think about I worked for a long time for the Yuma Indian tribe who this land is in their secret territory mm-hmm. and I actually have an atlas uh, that I helped produce for them that I'll put in there but it has a lot of that if you're interested in 
creation story for this area that the tribal members who live here um, still adhere to to some degree and still actually use in, in concert with science in their management of natural resources mm -hmm. in this area. And I'll put that through that book um, back by the library if anyone wants to see it. What's the title? It's called, um, it's, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll put a copy of it back there. Cassie, did you have? No, I didn't. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for bringing up the axial age and the establishment of the science because I have had conflict with that. Not conflicts, but you know, how does this fit in? And it's like the the idea had to be there first before it could take hold in the form of the coming of Baha'u'llah the Ba mm -hmm. in order to expand into a, 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 the universal application. Thank you. So the, um, so I've been feeling that, in, that the Baha'i faith is a forward thinking movement. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily that in the past is the past. And it's not that things are good and got bad, it's just that things are getting better. And Ahmed Baha'u'llah and Sogi Benny seemed like they never really wanted to address a whole lot of the past. Uh, um, we met the son of the Shah there. And, uh, and the Shah wanted to start you know, apologizing for the past and persecution and murdering them. And uh, Tom Price was a great talk about that. How Ahmed Baha'u'llah said, forget that, it's all in the past. Absolutely, yeah. There's a huge focus on the future in my faith. We're not focused on the history and, and that's the past. out of the common discourse going on in yeah. society at large. All that is about focusing on the past, breaking the past, yeah. da, da, da. But yeah. behind faith, I think uh, we should focus on what is the future? What is yeah. the laying out of behind faith? Yeah. And, and just to look, look. This, I, this idea that humanity is... is is on a journey collectively towards somewhere greater. Um, what what we call in in, uh, in philosophy and in science progress. The idea of progress is something again that is uh, is a is a child of the Enlightenment. Uh, what does Abdul Baha say about progress? In in uh, Paris talks, he gives us a beautiful little nugget in Paris talks. He says progress is the expression of spirit in the realm of matter. So. Even what we think of as the physical, you know, process, you know, the, the scientific, the, the material advancement of the human race, Abba says, progress in general, it says, is the expression of spirit in the realm of matter. And, and it's statements like this and others that I think get us in a different kind of frame of reference, which is no longer so starkly dualistic, which no longer divides the world so sharply into a spiritual and a physical. But, which isn't to say that it's no longer useful to talk about spiritual things versus material things. There's a great usefulness in that. But we'll, we'll in, the, in the next session or two, we're going to return, I think, multiple times to this question of spirit and matter and what in philosophical terms is called a dualistic conception of the universe. Dualism, like Cartesian dualism. Descartes was a very famous proponent of this. Uh, talking about difference between material things uh, and, and spiritual things. And, uh, and we'll be sort of addressing this question of Cartesian dualism. Is the Baha'i faith dualistic, fundamentally? Or is it monistic? Are there two kinds of things? Is there one kind of thing? We're asking that also, I think, in Unit 7. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter how we, how we set things up and how we look at the world. So I've been missing, I missed someone. I have, where's the next hand? Yes, in the back.
exactly. We create these boxes. And the most granular, most important boxes that we even forget are boxes, uh, unit four, is, no, unit one, is language. You know, words themselves are these boxes that we get it in our heads. And I love that quote by D.T. Suzuki the, the, from Buddhism, where he says, you know, we have this very unfortunate tendency of sticking a label on, you know, on something, a, a, assigning a word to something, and then figuring, you know, our work is done now, and, we, and, and that label is now permanently attached to that reality. And as our understandings of, of reality, you know, expand, what we thought was one reality may be many, or what we thought was many may be one. And other words, other labels that we thought were referring to different things may end up actually referring to the same thing. Example of this from unit five, religion and nature. Did you notice how Abdu'l Baha defines religion and nature in identical terms? And it's not an accident of translation. If you look at the original Persian, he's using the same phrase in Persian to, dis to define religion as he is to defining nature, as he is to defining love, faith, and law. All of these get the same definition. Essential relationships that proceed from the realities of things. So we'll come back to that in the next session.